Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB Specialist Performance Tester Certification. We are in chapter one talking about the basic concepts and have covered all the necessary topics of this chapter. Today we are talking about the sample questions from this chapter. As you can expect, the sample questions from this chapter will be straightforward and simple as we have not got into much detailed information which requires a lot of preparation to be understood. So so beginning here with the uh, question, uh, sample question pattern from this particular question as per the exam rules provided by istqb.org. So here you can expect altogether six questions. Uh, that is like uh, different topics distributed with different number of questions. And of course, all the topics are important. As you can see, at least there is one question from each of the topic. And there is one topic that is 1.2, which expects you to know at least two questions in the examination. So there will be five K2 topic and one K1 from 1.3. So 1.3 is very straightforward anyway. So, you know, you don't really have to put any effort, but other topics may require a little detailed understanding before you can hit the examination. So let's take quickly some sample questions and understand what do we mean by these K1 and K2. To begin with, the number one question we are taking here is which of the following is the best description of spike testing? The number one thing here before we talk about the options is what exactly spike stands for, right? We have discussed about this in the previous tutorials and we know a spike testing is something which talks about a sudden increment and drop in the number of concurrent users and that can happen in any type of application which invites people to hop into their web portals or application at certain point of time and of course they disappear just within few minutes or few seconds depending on the type of occasion or offer you are giving to them so spikes are generally experienced in such cases so here we have got few options let's have a look on understanding that a it focuses on the ability of system to handle loads that are gradually increased that's where it goes wrong when you talk about gradually increasing its endurance it's not spike look at b it focuses on the ability of system to handle loads that are at or beyond the expected peak load now that totally goes with the stress testing as the definition of it and does not apply to spike at all c it focuses on the ability of system to meet future efficiency requirements that goes with the definition of scalability testing not the spike and think we are just left with one option and that is d it focuses on the ability of the system to respond to quick and extreme changes in the load which is just like a sudden increment in the load is called a spike in the graph so the right answer here is d it focuses on the ability of the system to respond to quick and extreme changes in the load now you know that if you just remember the definition of all the different types of performance testing the answers are very simple to pick up Let's move to the second one here. Which of the following performance testing activities should occur during unit testing? Again, should go back to the tutorial and recall that a performance testing preparation can actually begin much earlier in the life cycle. In fact, the executions can also begin much earlier. So we need to identify here that what is that can be performed based on the given options right from the unit testing and we don't have to wait for the system to be established. Let's look at the option again. A testing end-to-end -end behavior under various load conditions and i hope this basically goes with uh, uh, the sit where you will generally integrate the end-to-end -end application and then you will test it so that can only happen after system or system integration testing but not at the unit level because at unit level you only have components with you and probably a program a piece of code that's it and you cannot just go with that B, testing data flows and workflows across interfaces. And again, B is not correct because this occurs during the SID, which is system integration. And the option talks about the integration that is data flow and interfaces. So we cannot do that unit at unit testing. C, testing key use cases and workflow using a top-down approach. And this is also not correct because this is also done during the integration testing. Integration testing from the foundation level, if you remember, we have top-down approach, bottom-up approach to be applied there. So that happens during integration testing again. 
last but not the least seems to be the right answer again that is testing to evaluate resource utilization and potential bottlenecks can be identified right at the unit level because we are talking about the response codes we are talking about the resource utilization of every single program then that can be done right at the unit level you don't really have to wait for the system to be established and then tested right so the right answer here is d testing to evaluate resource utilization and potential bottlenecks which is the right answer let's look at the next question of this particular tutorial that is when is the when is it appropriate to generate load via the applications apis now if you remember one of the topic we discussed about that how generally the load can be generated by different means we have ui we have apis we have the uh, interface and we have the definitely the load generation a lot many things being discussed there uh, so let's look, let's look at the direct options here a when a large number of tests are available who can represent the real users and I hope uh, when we have the real users with us, we don't really uh, have to have a uh, you know, count of you know, APIs to be applied load for because this goes to uh, crowd testing and these testers should be using the real UI and we don't really need to depend on APIs to apply the load or generate the load, right? So crowd testing is being applied in the option A and in that case, the real users are using real UI, not the APIs. Let's look at B, when testing must be conducted at the communication protocol level. Now, a B is also not correct. The reason is communication protocol level is one level below the API level, and that does not really need to have APIs to be into considerations to apply or generate the loads. So that's also incorrect. Let's have a look on C, when the UI is likely to change, but the transactions must be processed as if they were created through the UI. Now that's the most appropriate thing where API comes into picture because UI is unstable. Even if you're talking about your crowd, you're talking about simulation, you're talking about protocol based script generation. If UI is unstable, you cannot go with that. But the transaction are being processed just like UI, then API, that's where API comes into picture. So C is correct because testing through the API makes the most sense when the UI is unstable. And uh, definitely the full communication can definitely be performed without involving the UI. So it seems to be the right answer there, but let's look at the D. Uh, when only small number of test instances are available. So D is absolutely not correct because many test in instances can be created with API testing and there's no limitation with that. So that's irrelevant again. So finally concluding, the right answer here is C, when the UI is likely to change, but the transactions must be processed as if they were created through the UI. Well, that's all from this particular tutorial team. We were talking about the sample questions of the chapter one basic concepts. Looking forward to move into the chapter two in our next tutorial. So should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.